Our generation gap videos aim to uncover specific needs and highlight possible actions to help plan and achieve future financial goals dependent on the age group you fall into. In this generation gap video, we're going to take a look at the silent generation, born between 1928 and 1945. So now the youngest are in their mid 70s and the oldest heading toward a birthday card from the king. What can we say about the silent generation? A generation of which many remember rationing. They still keep up with the news in paper form, such as the Daily Mail. They can be strong-willed, independent, appearing somewhat distant from the ideals of Gen Z. They worry about health and the personal securities. And they've got other major factors, not least taking care of personal and family interests once they're no longer able to do so. Of course, they are a generation raised on a nice cup of tea and they could teach us a thing or two about how to waltz, cut a rug with a jive, or impress Edda Cayley with a gay Gordons. The silent generation grew up experiencing the immediate aftermath of World War II, but what could they learn from rationing and apply to their management of cash? Or do they need to? I think there's a lot that we, as a society, can learn from the silent generation. But they're so stoic in the main in terms of their outlook, they're, they're not natural sharers. So quite often it feels like you've got to take a can opener to them to for them to share the experiences because they have got some pills of wisdom and it's important for all of us that those pills of wisdom ideally are shared before they have any cognitive slowdown so um yeah lots of lessons to learn but the theme about budgeting i think from again my experiences um not always aware of their significant finance that they've amassed and that's not them being secret squirrel about it. It's just, they just aren't aware. Um, incredibly cautious. Um, and there can be a disconnect, as you've alluded to, um, from the silent generation to, to the Gen Zs, where what I would like to see selfishly um, is a, this cascade of wealth and capital from literary grandparents to, to grandchildren in a more tax efficient way um, to help them get on the property ladder um, and, and also um, for the Gen Zs who probably should be a little bit more appreciative of the silent generation in terms of the support that is there and support is needed be it for educational costs, be it for amassing cash for, for property etc. And a degree of nervousness from the silent generation when it comes to the care provision and they will have friends who are passing away and what provision do they need to make? I think they become incredibly reliant, which we're happy to pick up on um, and lean on children from a financial awareness point, what they should be doing. They may have retired before the technology revolution started, so they've almost had an easy opt-out, which is a concern where some of the efficiencies about operating certain benefits online we talked about earlier just won't be accessible if you don't use the internet more robustly. Um, but I think, again, as a community and as a society, we need to help them. So I think what I'd like to see, I've mentioned this to a number of professionals is almost like a support network on technology where we look after what they need. I'll give you an example of a client I was in, in Cheltenham only a week ago and we talked through investment markets, we talked through the Liz Trust situation, people in their late 70s very cognizant about what was going on and before we left and, and I was there with, with the, the investment manager for a good two hours um, is the question was asked of us both whether we could help them with the setup of their Panasonic TV. Because that sort of support uh, is going to pass them by if they're not careful. Now, hopefully they can speak to children and grandchildren to help. But I think we, as a society, we need to be better than that. And actually, the ability to get a good Wi-Fi and good technology from the right people at the right cost 
the ability to make sure that you've got a, a sensible phone that does what you need it to do so it's got the right app so you can know what gate you're flying from if you're going abroad etc that you can sort out your parking so i think there are some financial education pieces which i believe as a, as a society it's something that should that very strongly that, should, that something should be done because it's too it's too much of an easy opt-out and one of the difficulties as well is this is a generation that can benefit from a lot of that technology and also uh, a generation that relies on things like television and with most digital provision of television and subscription costs it's not cheap and if you're going for one of the main providers the inertia of not renegotiating a contract can become very expensive indeed so uh, that's the point you, you make there about support network is fabulous because too many people go without because and and spend far too much money on these these because that, that, that's the way they run their subscription service you know yes. don't talk to us great by the way it's going up by 20 percent, 30 percent. yeah and I, and I think uh, and it's a point that would have be been relevant to all the generations um is that making sure you know the will and lasting power of attorney in place because you're probably at a time now where the lasting power of attorney is being invoked because through mental incapacity and slowdown um, they want assistance but also maybe through medical conditions there's a need so actually being across that and making sure that those mechanisms are in place is incredibly important I speak personally about that is that again the examples earlier about deposit rate improvements one can make I can do that as, as an attorney for my father just to improve his situation. So we're still staying in the same asset class. We're just improving his interest rate. And what I would always say, again, without, likewise, without wishing to sound political and, and, and sitting on the fence on this, always speak to a lawyer. And, and again, we would work in it from a team perspective with an accountant on the tax side. And obviously we're lawyers on the, on the legal side, but they, they go hand in glove and making sure these mechanisms are in place. Um, and certainly with young, professionals I'm encouraging them all the time to you know and they talk about protection they talk about life policies I'm saying yes but actually protection is also the legal frameworks that assist you at a future point in time um, but obviously they get more regularly deployed from the silent generation who are looking to lean on their attorneys typically children close friends etc um, and then you, you you uncover all sorts of mysterious payments to insurances on washing machines and bits and pieces oh, yeah. that, that actually um, that they, sh they should be in place they should be in place but act actually it's understanding why they're paying for these particular benefits um, because they're happy to do so because the loyalty you get from the silent generation is considerable it might it might it might be silent loyalty sometimes but they'll just commit and they'll do what they've always done but actually, as we spoke about with technology, time has moved on and there can be efficiencies that is just passing them by. And that's such a disappointment. The latest statistics are suggesting that one in five uh, of this generation might be expected to live to at least 100. What advice would you give to ensure adequate care provision for this generation? It is a concern that you could outlive your capital. Um, but again, from a planning perspective, we're not looking to do cash flow modelling to age 85, 86. We are pushing it out to 1990s, just to give the example of the impact. Um, and also looking at scenarios, OK, if, if care is needed, what are the care potential care costs in your locality? And what is the impact on and how it's funded? But that's about scenario planning, which most financial planners will be doing with their clients. Um, and you return to it once you've got that framework, you can tweak it. Um, so I think it's an, an absolutely immensely worthwhile ex exercise to stress test longevity of capital given certain scenarios and always being I'd encourage people to be pessimistic by, by that I mean don't assume very high investment returns but do assume high inflation so we're being if we get surprises in the future they're positive surprises because there's nothing worse than making these wonderful colour charts and in life red's always bad and green's good. You say, oh, don't worry, I've got enough money because I can see there's a green line there. But actually, if, if our assumptions are too outrageously positive, it's not a help. So we tend to be cautiously pessimistic and review that, 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 that framework. But also make sure that with all our planning, it's flexible because there could be change to rules and regulation. But more importantly, at that, that age of life, 
change to, me to, to medical situation, which we've got to be able to adapt to. Um, so uh, keeping it simple, I think, understanding the legal mechanisms and frameworks that, were, that, that are available, but also cash flow modelling is key. That's go I would say for anybody from age 40 onwards, effectively, just scenario planning, linking it with your goals and objectives, which will be somewhat reduced from the site generation, but stress testing how long your money is going to last. Because by definition, the quality of life living to 100 is a concern. Therefore, the quality of care will be considerable. And those are the sort of things that we'd be looking at. What sort of response do you get when you talk about a cash flow forecast with somebody in the silent generation? Do they, do they embrace it or do they, yeah. they go a bit cross-eyed? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think cash flow modelling can be seen as um, smoke and mirrors, I suppose, designed to confuse, which it's absolutely not. And again, like anything, it's only as good as the data you put into it. So once you've got good raw data in terms of income and expenditure and assumptions and life events, um, for it can be assisting with a granddaughter's wedding or whatever. So you understand you get all those things in. It makes it very personal, makes it live and breathe. Uh, it eventually instills a degree of confidence, not a guarantee, but a degree of confidence. And you've got a plan that is malleable and a significant change ahead, obviously, the, the political landscape, the financial landscape. Um, I'd like to see politicians thinking beyond a five-year cycle in respect of what we need to support in the, in the care system and beyond, and from an educational perspective, because this needs significant investment through decades of underinvestment to get people to a better informed. And my view as a financial planner, if you're better informed, you can make better decisions. I see a lot of adverts on telly where they, they focus in on equity release and they're focusing on older generations and offering all the sort of benefits and all the wonderful upside of what that could be. But it's not all hearts and flowers, is it? There's, there's, there's very much a downside. Equity release has been with us for, for, for decades now. Um, but I think in terms of the rules of traditional lending, which are ageist, um, and the fact that there are some families who are looking to release, unlock equity for potentially to support family members, um, you need to take specialist advice. Now, there might be mortgage brokers out there who have the appropriate qualifications. I mean, we certainly, um, within, the, within the, the team, we have specialists. Like, I think that's important, as lawyers are, that you're not a generalist and you're flitting from, um, from investment and pensions and pretend you're an equity release expert in the same day. So we have a number of, of the team who are Society of Later Life Specialists and have the equity release qualification as well. So we would always involve that person uh, and they in turn typically quite rightly involve the family because it is a family consideration family awareness um, and i think also um, i shouldn't generalize but on this occasion i will which is it should be an asset of last resort yeah. in terms of sort of product of last resort is look at all of the areas first but it is there uh, again as, as, as having a, a wide remit and, and wide vision it's to understand the costs the concerns um, and ultimately, why? Why, why? why are we considering equity? What's the actual capital goal here?